everybody. Uh, today we have a speaker who's a PhD student at Rice and uh, Uppsala University. Uh, and the topic for today is geometric deep learning with craft neural networks. And uh, the questions during the talk, uh, you can address those in the chat and, and I will uh, bring them up to Maria and then we can have a discussion after, after the, the presentation is, is done. So please, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, as you said, my name is Maria and uh, uh, I do my research in machine learning and especially I uh, apply deep learning and machine learning to uh, application in sciences such as uh, physics and chemistry. And in the, these areas, uh, the data sets are usually really complicated. It can be like surfaces or graphs or something. And traditional deep uh, neural networks uh, doesn't work well on these data sets. So an umbrella term for these more tools you use for these more complicated data sets is called geometric deep learning. And uh, a tool that is really nice in this toolbox is the graph neural network. And so if you have Euclidean data, uh, traditional deep learning works really well. So it's data that you have on the flat surface or as a sequence, such as an image or a text or uh, audio. But what if the data looks like this? Here we see a molecule with the objects with relations to each other or a surface where you want to model something on this surface. Now the data is not Euclidean anymore, so the deep learning or convolutional network doesn't work well. And a tool you can use now if you want. So what you can do is actually, if you're able to represent your data on a graph, you can use this graph neural network instead. It's a, something where you combine deep learning with the graphs. So uh, so first we will go through some basic concepts about uh, graphs. Uh, so here <coughs> is a graph where we find the objects in the graph as nodes and the, the relationship between the objects as edges. And you can now both have undirected graphs. So you have information going both ways. It goes from both here to four to five and back from five to four. You can also have directed graphs, so the information comes from one object to another. And another important thing is, is that we have to define is the adjacency matrix, and it's basically just set, tells us which relationships we have in the graphs. So if we have a one, uh, we have a we have a edge coming from the nodes, uh, and if it's zero, we have, don't have any edge. So the dimension is the same as the number of nodes in the graph. So if the graph is undirected, this would be a symmetric matrix. And uh, to perform deep learning on graphs, we first will go through uh, the convolutional neural network, which we uh, will use to apply this new deep learning uh, network on the graph. So convolutional neural network, they use uh, a filter that they multiply uh, so they update the nodes in the graph by using a filter, which is the same everywhere. It's uh, element-wise dot product with uh, the area in this, uh, <laughs> this is, goes really fast now, but this, this area in this uh, shaded area, and then they just sum them up and then you get a new representation of that. Uh, what, if, if it's a pixel, yeah, if, if it's an image, it's a pixel. So you get a new represent representation of that pixels. That's the basic, uh, the, the basic concept of a convolution. So if we have this convolution on the image, we can actually see this convolution as a graph with the information coming from the surrounding nodes. So if you wanna update the source node here in the middle, uh, we take information from all the surrounding nodes. <coughs> and uh, yeah. So this is the basic idea behind a convolution for a graph. So, but instead of taking the neighborhood uh, that is close uh, to the source node in the middle, 
the neighborhood is instead the nodes that are connected to so the no source node with edges. So this becomes the neighborhood in a graph neural network. So this is kind of a way to generalize the convolution. So now we have generalized the convolution. The edges can now be of different shapes. And uh, by doing this, we can actually use this model now to uh, model uh, to create graphs on any structure we want. So here we have an example of curved, the 3D curved surfaces. So we can apply these graphs here, or if we have point clouds, we can also apply the graphs here. And then the neighborhood would be the points closest to the source node. Um, and since we have a graph, we can also represent uh, objects with relationship to each other. So here we have ob uh, objects in the pictures, or we have physical particles moving around, uh, interacting with each other. Uh, it can also be represented with these graphs or uh, knowledge graphs. Um, so now uh, we will try to define the basic convolution of this graph neural network and they are called the uh, message passing. Maybe you heard that name before but it's basically the convolution of a graph neural network. So it's called message passing since messages are arriving from all the neighboring nodes deriving new messages sent to the source node and then they update the source node with these new messages. And uh, this feature in the node, they don't have to be like scalar, it can be like multi-dimensional features. Uh, for example, I, when I use this graph neural network on molecules, uh, the node representation consists of maybe the weight of the atom and uh, the charge, and maybe also some other feature that you want to include. And you can just con concatenate them to a long feature vector. Um, so in the end, all these message passages, passages in the graph are happening at the same time. So the mass messages are traveling around in the graph neural network. Uh, to go into a little bit more detail about the, the message passing. Uh, it consists of three steps, you can say. So first, you derive the message for each neighboring node. So each of these neighboring nodes uh, gets a message. We call them MJ higher here. And the message is uh, derived by using information about the source node, about the neighboring node itself, and then you could also include some information about the edge uh, called edge features. Uh, so you, do, you have to derive them for all the neighboring nodes. And then you want to, to merge them together, you aggregate them. And uh, this aggregation function uh, must be constructed so you can have, uh, it can vary how many nodes you're connected to. It shouldn't matter if they, if they are four neighboring nodes or five or, or less. And they also have to be permutation invariant. So the most common way to aggregate messages is to take the mean or the max or the sum or something like that. Uh, in the end, you want to update the source node in the middle. Uh, and you do this with uh, using this feature, you, the aggregated feature uh, or vector and uh, the information about yourself. So this is like a generalization of the message passing. You can include uh, all this different message passing algorithm inside this, these three steps, but they all look different. Sometimes you don't have any uh, edge feature here or something, uh, and they can vary a lot, but this is like a generalization. And both the U and the M can be any function you want. They can be, for example, a neural network with parameters that you train uh, with back, pro back propagation in the end. Um, or just a matrix multipl multiplication or something. So to go through this again, we see that we derive the message for all the neighboring nodes. Uh, we uh, aggregate them, here we do the mean, and then we update the feature of the, the source node again. 
So here it's updated. So this is like a layer in a graph neural network. But we, of course, want to stack multiple layers after each other, as we always do in deep learning. So we stack these after each other. So if you input a graph, you do this uh, message passing layer, and uh, you do them for all the nodes at the same time, as I explained before. Uh, and out comes a graph. So the structure is the same, but the feature for each node has uh, changed and they don't have to be the same dimension anymore. But the, the edges uh, between the nodes are the same and everything is the same, but, but the feature of the node differ and they can be, uh, the, the dimension can decrease or increase or something. And then uh, per node, we do some something in the middle, maybe some activation function or residual connection or some dropout, whatever you want <laughs> add to add there. Uh, and out comes the graph again, of course, but updated. And then you can go through another layer. And uh, yeah, you can add multiple layers here. So I will show you one example of one of the most famous convolutional neural uh, convolution, graph convolution, uh, which is called the graph convolution, but <laughs> Yeah, uh, it was it was it, it, it was quite early, so uh, that's why it's called that. Um, and uh, I show you because it's quite simple, so it's uh, it's nice to see that it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, so the message for each node is just the neighboring node itself, but also you can also multiply it with some uh, uh, edge weight if you want to. Uh, the most common common thing is to just have a one here, but if you have one to edge an um, edge weight here, you can. And then you divide it with the, uh, what do you call it? The degree of each node, which is the degree of each node is the number of nodes each node is connected with. So xi here would have a degree of uh, four, while xj here has the degree of one. And then the aggregating step, is just taking the sum of each, each messages. And the update is just taking a matrix multiplication. Uh, so it's quite simple and it's really common and widely used uh, and works really well. Uh, so when you have this graph neural network, you of course want to do something with it like prediction or use it in an unsupervised learning task. And uh, here I present the three different ways you can use it for supervised learning. The first one is <coughs> node classification. So sometimes you just want to classify one on the node in the network and you can both, and then you take just the feature of that node and maybe make it go through some feed for network and then you can classify it. Uh, and it's common to both the most common thing is to, to classify some parts of nodes in the network and nodes know, know the classified or have the knowledge of the other nodes. Uh, but sometimes you want to classify all nodes in the network. Uh, you can also do graph classification. And here you have the, the output is uh, the whole graph, so you have to do some pooling, which is called when you merge all the nodes together to one node. There are many ways to do pooling in graph neural networks. So this is like the simplest one where you just sum up all the information or take the mean of all the node information. And then you can take that through some feed for network and classify it on that. Uh, so I use gra uh, graph classification to classify molecule feature for the whole molecule. And uh, so it's, it's useful. The last thing uh, that is common to use for with graph neural network is link prediction. So here you want to predict if there is a link between two nodes or not. Uh, and when you train it, you usually you use, you add the fake nodes and real nodes and try to predict which one are real. And in the end, you can predict if there is a connection between two nodes or not. So Maria, can you take a question? Yep. yep. Uh, it's, there's an active chat, uh, which is really nice. Uh, Swapnil asks, uh, uh, does size of the graph influence overall model prediction since you employ aggregation? 
Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so, so I suppose this question was perhaps before this slide, uh, and uh, because do you this mean slide, uh, with this, this uh, if, if this slide? In, uh, like, in the next in the next slide, you do you do explain that that when you you make a prediction for one node, you you do take input, which is the whole graph, right? Yeah. So in that sense, the whole graph does influence. So I suppose that's yeah, yeah. In this case, it does influence. If you have, if you have the information for all the other nodes, then it's easier to yeah, it's influencing. If you do no do node prediction, because in, in this node prediction task, you you add information. If you have, if you know the nodes information of the other graph, it influences the prediction of this. If that mm -hmm. if that's what yeah. Uh, some other question? No, not now. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, there's a lot of unsupervised learning techniques for graph neural network. I would just talk about one simple idea, and um, uh, you can imagine the rest, I guess. And it's the graph autoencoder. So if you look at the traditional autoencoder, you have an input and then you compress it with some decoder to some uh, latent space. And then you can, uh, you try to recreate it uh, in the decoder again. And hopefully you have some useful representation here in the middle. And you can make this probabilistic with a very variational autoencoder as well. So you can sample output in the end. So in the graph autoencoder on the other hand, we have a, a graph as an input that goes th through a graph neural network. And we get a latent uh, representation of the graph nodes that is probably uh, has lower dimension than the uh, features, the, the input nodes features. Um, and what you wanna do is just use these uh, node features to, in the decode, you want to recreate the adjacency matrix which is uh, like recreated the edges in the graph again. And it, when you train a data set with this, hopefully you again have some nice representation here that you can use for, for other machine learning tasks. And you can also make this uh, probabilistic uh, in, in, the, in the middle by uh, uh, doing a variational, gra gra variational graph autoencoder. And uh, then you can sample edges in a graph. And they're also autoencoder, which try to rec recreate the, the node features as well. Uh, sometimes an, uh, at the same time as edges, but sometimes you want to have the structure in the graph and just recreate the uh, uh, node features. See what I have. So I will talk a bit. Another useful tool in graph neural network is to add uh, attention. And then you add the attention to the neighboring nodes. So. Uh, it's a score of how important each neighboring node is. So, uh, you, 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 so when you want to add attention in a graph neural network, you, you still derive your message, but you also derive your attention score, which shows how important the neighboring node is. And in this, this function, you can add yourself at the neighboring node, or you can also add the source node to this function. Uh, then I guess it's self-attention. But uh, in the end, when you aggregate, then you instead have a weighted sum uh, with the attention weight. And uh, this, by, by seeing this, of course, we have to make the connection with the transformers. Because in a transformer block, we have the inputs. Uh, uh, we have the inputs here. If we want to re- uh, update the feature of x1 here, we use all the other inputs uh, to the transformer and derive weights for each of them, uh, attention weights. And then uh, we calculate the new uh, feature, uh, the latent feature of x1 by taking the weighted sum of this. And all in here, we also multiply it with some matrix. And, and we do this for, if we have, for example, a word, I guess, this can be a sentence with uh, four words. <laughs> you do this for all the words in the sentence in the transformer. So if we translate this to a graph, we would just 
add a lot of uh, nodes to the graph, like between all, a lot of, not, not nodes, edges, of course. Uh, between all nodes, we add edges. So we have edges between every node in the graph. Uh, so this kind of removes the structure we had in the beginning, but maybe it adds information. Uh, and then we can do the message passing on this new uh, graph. So we derive a, a message, which now is a matrix multiplication, just as for the transformer. And then we can derive the attention weights uh, at, at the same time, as I explained before. Um, and then in the aggregated function, we state the weighted sum instead. And when we update the node, we do some layer norm for the feed forward and a layer norm again. And this becomes a transformer. So the question is, is a transformer a graph neural network or the other way around? I don't know, but there is a link. And sometimes maybe you can see it as you add a lot more structure when you use a graph neural network, but and some maybe you need to add some inspiration from the transformer. Maybe you should add more nodes, but also maybe the transformer should reduce the number of nodes a bit since uh, to become more similar to the graph neural network. So uh, in RISE, I work with graph neural network in two ways right now. Uh, no, this is two of the ways I work with graph neural network, <laughs> I should say. Um, I use them for predict pre predicting how toxic a molecule is. Uh, and here you can see pretty much how you would represent a molecule as a graph. It's it explains itself. Um, and I also use it to find uh, the, geom the geometry of the molecule. So usually the molecule is just rep represented like this in 2D, but for many applications, you also want the rep representation of the molecule in 3D. So you want to know how it's like, it looks like, how it's spaced out or so you call it. Um, and it can be, it, it can look in many different ways because you can bend the molecule and rotate it. So you need to know all the, the, the different shape the molecule can have in order to, in the end, maybe predict stuff on the molecule. And uh, yeah, that's what I use graph neural network for. I would just uh, end this talk with showing some cool applications of graph neural network. And the first one is this, uh, mesh uh, space. Uh, the DeepMind has used a graph neural network to simulate a mesh. So we can look at it. Uh, so it's a simulation, uh, one step ahead uh, simulation. They try to predict one time step at a time. Uh, and uh, they transform the mesh to a graph uh, and they use this graph to predict the, the acceleration of uh, of the, the mesh, and then they use that to update the mesh again for the next time step. Ah, and some other code they use it. So these are un unrolled in, in several steps then? Yeah, exactly. So they first train it a lot and then you just unroll it, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, here is again DeepMind that had used the uh, graph neural network for traffic prediction. Uh, so they worked with uh, Google Maps to predict traffic. It, you use it when you want to find the shortest uh, road, the, dis the distance when you go, want to go from one location to another. Uh, and they use graphs to improve their, the scores. So the graph, they divided the streets, the streets in nodes and had edges between them. Uh, and they use that and they improve the results, results a lot for their uh, prediction in and this this map just show the improved scores of all the predictions road predictions and uh, the final step which is a uh, thing uh, I want to highlight is that they just find found a new antibiotics with uh, using a graph neural network uh, and it was a quite simple model they trained it on a small data set, sets with antibiotics and tried to predict if it's a good antibiotic or not. And then they just use the same model for a really large data set. And in that large age, large data set, they find a new antibiotic that works, worked really, it worked well in the lab in the end. So simple model that was really useful with the graph. And uh, I guess that was 
everything uh, I had to say. Oh yeah, the end. I just want to mention that there are a lot of libraries you can use for uh, graphs in PyTorch and in TensorFlow and also in JAX if someone has started, has started with that. Um, I myself use PyTorch Geometric a lot, but I think the deep graph library is uh, really good and that works in both PyTorch and TensorFlow. So if you want to talk about graph neural network, you can just contact me and we can discuss the research. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so if we have questions, now, now is the time to, to bring up your questions. We well, have several comments in the chat. Uh, nice presentation, good presentation. Uh, but uh, now I think it's, it's also OK to unmute if you want to ask a question directly to Maria. If I can answer. Well, this is this is the discussion. We don't need to. You don't need to have. Yeah, exactly. You can add to. You know, oh. this. I don't see the we'll try. comments right now. I need to. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So, so I have a question about the uh, about the connection oh, yeah. to the transformer. Um, there's been some some uh, variants of the transformer, such as uh, uh, the the. I forget all the names, uh, but but uh, in particular, more sparse oh. uh, transformers. Um, is that is that could that be expressed as as a graph uh, neural network in the sense that we we remove uh, things from from the attention uh, from the attention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ways, I think right? in this and those areas, they use different technique to make it sparse than the moving edges uh, in in a graph. But uh, you can see, I think you can see a graph as a sparse transformer as well, if you want to. But I don't think it, it, they use that technique in those papers. They use other uh, techniques. Uh, yeah. So, so with a graph neural network, you're, you, you make, the, the edges are, of course, informed by the data in, like, in a molecule. It's, it's the bound. Mm. But, but uh, in a sparse transformer, I suppose it's, it's just sparse. Yeah, it's sparse in other ways. But it's a nice connection. Maybe there are things you can do here to, to make the transformer more sparse by thinking how you do it in a graph neural network. I don't know how much work has been done in that, but I don't think those really that those hyped recent papers in transformer are can be connected. I don't really understand. Mm. I don't remember exactly how they did, but I, I don't see the connection because they more use the sparse techniques to do it. Mm. Uh, or perhaps uh, Anders here, um, perhaps, uh, I can just continue that question. Uh, and yes. I'm not sure if you mean the long former and that they use global and local attention and in that way you know, make it sparse. Oh, that may be the global local look, look, look sounds like it could be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't read that. Um, it could potentially be that, but I actually don't understand really the idea that you presented saying that transformer connect an edge to every node and then the, the remove the structure. I mean, they, they must keep the original structure some way, right? I mean, otherwise you just lose that well, information. Uh, the transformer, as you work on a, on a sequence, uh, that you, you consider that sequence to be a complete yeah. graph. I think that's that's the interpretation. Yeah, if you would, for example, have a molecule, which I work with, you would mm. not just to use the bonds between the, the molecules, you would also add new edges, which, uh, but also in the transformer, you don't, you don't have any edge feature at all. Yeah. I mean, if, so, you, look uh, if the... you have edge features, then, then that, then you need to have a graph without edge features. That's really common though, that you don't have edge feature. That's- Yeah, but, but even if you don't have edge features, just that you have edges, um, it, according to your slide at least, I probably misunderstood it, but it looked like it simply added edges everywhere. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, so it, what happens with the original structure? Is that kept some way or what? what uh, no, in this, this I, I guess you can see it as a, a sentence. It's, it's a quite nice. If you look at a sentence uh, in the beginning, maybe you think there's only connection between the next uh, word. So you only add the uh, edges between all the words. That would be one way to represent the sentence, but you can also add edges between all the words in the sentence. So then you lose structure, but you add flexibility. Yeah. I could add, add there that there are modifications to the transformer to try to capture this structure, which typically uh, 
it, it boils down to that for each attention weight, not only do you have the uh, self attention, the, the dot product self attention, but you also add some other function of the uh, of the edge between these two nodes, or for example, the shortest path between two nodes on the graph, so that you can actually learn how the edge information should con contribute to the attention score between nodes. Mm -hmm. So transformers direct uh, transformers uh, which are tailored towards graph typically in include the the graph structure by adding extra turns to the attention scores. Yeah. But usually when you, yeah, I think you can have edge, but usually when you do attention in graph neural network, the common way is to use, even if you use attention in graph neural network, you don't have any edge feature at all. You, you remove the edge feature and have a attention weight instead. That's the traditional so, way, but there are other, like maybe yeah. some new ways to do it. But. So on that note, how do you typically include edge features in these classical graph neural networks? <clears throat> if you don't have attention the, to have uh, edge features in the graph neural network, that's here. Let's see here, you add it to the message passing step. Right, right. But the, there are some multiple ways to do it. In I have in my application, I have a way to do it. So you, you, you create an embedding of the edge feature. You would make it go through a neural network, and then you get a, a weight from that, and you multiply it with the, the neighboring node. That's one way. But there are uh, so many ways to do it. Be using the edges for for the attention weights. Uh, yeah, then there's, uh, I guess there, it's some kind of, you, can, you still derive some weight that you multiply the, the neighbor feature with, yeah. So when you compute the, this embedding for, for the edge, uh, do you take also into consideration the, the adjacent nodes for that edge? Mm, not in a common way, but there are so many, oh, mm. yeah, not, not in my application, but I guess you can you can think of any if you go if you start with this these three steps you can come up with a lot of stuff ways to do this. <laughs> yes. As I said, maybe you can like create a new neuros paper and it's a very flexible stuff, yeah. flexible space. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so Lars is waving his hand. Yeah, uh, I, I was thinking we talked about graphical um, networks before and then I mean one needs some way to represent who is close to whom and here we had an adjacency matrix. Uh, before, when we talked about it, I think Eric presented some way where you did a random walk, um, oh, wow. sort of to capture. So you captured the, the, the neighborhood by a bunch of random walks, starting from a, a short random walk. Like, I don't right. know if I did that, but, but that's typically called node to vec, where you essentially. Yeah, OK, them. yeah. So I was thinking, is this, the, is this the new state of the art? And is it better or what's the relationship between these two different ways of encoding a, a graph? I think this is a new state of the art, but maybe Eric knows more. Yeah, I would say that uh, th there are differences in kind of what you want to do. So node to vec, for example, there you want to learn representations oh. of the nodes for a certain graph, uh, but not for graphs in general. So okay. That, mm. that will not typically, you know, given that you have a citation network and you want to learn something about the, the author in this network, you can use something like Notovec and how they are similar to each other. Uh, however, imagine that you now have a new, uh, complete new citation network with completely different authors. Uh, the previous information won't, won't give you anything. So these are kind of different, different problems you try to solve. And in this case, it's more like we want to be able to, you know, uh, have inducted uh, inductions over new kind of graphs or new graphs. So a more general framework, I would say. OK. Yeah, I can just add to that as well, because uh, I think I mentioned the, the random walk thing, um, which was for another application of trying to use transformers for graphs, which is trying to predict you know, what the next node should be. So in that way, you simply took a number of random walks across the, the graph, and then you have a clear sequence. And then you can easily fit that into a transformer and you simply use the normal kind of training that the transformer has to understand like the contextual meaning of each node, just as it can understand the, the contextual meaning of each word in, in text. So that is very easy to understand how that should work. And it seems to work really well. Um, but I'm still not sure how the you know, connecting to every node should really capture the true structure of the graph. Um, it, it doesn't. So that's, 
yeah, that, that's, yeah that, that's my problem i guess so, <laughs> so that's it does of, that, yeah. it's more i think to to illustrate that a transformer and a graph neural network they are very similar in in kind of what they do if we think of the mathematical structure of these models yeah i'm sure um, i can buy that actually it's just annoying to throw away information yeah if you have information on how everything looks but for example for me when i have a molecule uh, i add edges between all the nodes and try to model it but maybe that doesn't isn't enough maybe uh, uh, nodes in other areas in the molecule uh, contribute to my node itself if it's big for example or if it's close in space and uh, like uh, molecule can be uh, atoms can be close to each other in space but not with, along the edges and then maybe you are the the performance will improve if you add edges uh, to that graph mm. so you sometimes it adds inform it adds information but it can also like ruin i guess everything <laughs> and then you could include in your edge information whether or not they're directly adjacent or over longer distance right exactly yeah, yeah. so very successful version of this uses the shortest path between any two nodes in, in the graph as of those shortest paths, paths as an extra term in the tension weights for a transformer. Uh, but that could easily also be included for a, in a graph neural network, which would then, uh, you know, getting closer and closer to what the transformer actually does. Hmm. There's a question in the chat. Uh, I'm, I'm doing Olaf's job now and reading this out. <laughs> um, can the feature size in each node be different? Uh, no, I think uh, maybe in some, if you set up your own uh, network, but they should be the same because you need this convolutional uh, way of doing it that you use the same, same, uh, yeah, you, you use the same function for every node. And so they, they, you must have a convolution that doesn't care uh, how many nodes you're connected to, and they must do the same thing for every node. So it cannot vary. Yeah, but, but you, maybe adds. you can add some uh, some adjustment to the model and do it. I guess mm -hmm. you could do Thanks. some padding, perhaps. Yeah, padding. Yeah, for sure. Or imagine that that you coupled oh. each each node with a some kind of generative network to generate some, depending on what you want to do. Uh, you could have a decoder which generates arbitrary length outputs for each node, uh, if that is something you need to do. Yeah, as long as you do the same thing for every node, so it's, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose it's also a question, what does it mean to have a different size of the features? Uh, does that mean that, that it's inherently very different kinds of information that you have in different nodes? Uh, then mm. perhaps you could have different encoders for, for different kinds of nodes. I imagine that it's a network of some kind of entities which can have different kinds of information uh, coupled to them. Perhaps it's a it's a knowledge graph where each uh, entity here might I don't know have arbitrary sized uh, feature features. Uh, so it really depends on the on exactly why you would like to have different size features. Uh, but there, it sounds reasonable to do some padding or to do some zeroing out of the information that you don't have or something. Yeah. Uh, just look at the, the question as well, underscore again. And um, the, when I worked at Spotify, now we used <clears throat> we used a number of graph algorithms for various purposes, um, usually in related to artists and songs and and albums, etc. But it could also be users. And, and if you go to the user space, you directly move into hundreds of millions of users and a big data kind of problem. And then you have to use techniques that works with big data size of problems. And usually that means like Spark uh, kind of implementations and Spark has these kind of uh, graph X and this new type of, or old these days, I guess, but at that time it was new ways to just process really large uh, sets of data in a paralyzed way. Is that something you have looked into and, and seen you know, how these kind of old style big data graph processing algorithms work, like latent pro propagation and these kind of things? I haven't looked at that type of data, no, but yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so many and, ways and to use graphs. So, yeah. Cool stuff. And, and yeah. thanks for the presentation, really good. So thank, thank you. you.
But I guess in principle, you should be able to do something like that because yeah. these these uh, computations are. Uh, since you only look at the neighborhood, you can al also structure the computations according to, well, assuming that you have a sparse graph. Uh, well, that's a big assumption. I mean, if you put in the whole graph, it would be completely impossible. So I don't think this, this type of approach would work in that case, but yeah, good question. I, I think uh, in the DeepMind paper that uh, Maria suggests that they actually, the whole purpose of graph neural network was to scale it. Uh, so they wanted to be able to scale it, and then if you sim if you have a simple functions on edges and also as messages, then you can scale it and still get very good results. Mm. Mm -hmm. Instead of using a transformer, though, then or what do you mean? No, no, not transformers, but more like a, a general graph uh, graph neural networks. Okay. But the whole problem if you have big graphs is you need to partition the graphs because that it's impossible to, to process the whole graph at once. Mm. So you need to find a way to partition it. And uh, then you have to have a, some kind of smart way to do it. So you don't, yeah, you approximate it in an as good way as possible. This is actually something if you know the old uh, Datu company or Graph Lab, as I recall, before Apple bought them and destroyed the whole company. Uh, <laughs> sorry for being a bit. Uh, annoyed about that, but they had actually really good software uh, for doing this. It's kind of gas algorithms and gathering, aggregating and, and scattering algorithms that work really well, well for graphs. But it, all of that is gone these days. Uh, so yeah, don't use Apple computers and products, please. <laughs> well, then I think we should thank Maria again. Thank you for a nice talk and thank, thanks for a nice discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, will you give put the slides somewhere? Yeah, I can send them uh, to I don't we'll, know. We'll put them on the on the seminar webpage. Okay. Hmm? Which is linked from, from the emails. Maybe tomorrow or something. I need to remove some stuff. <laughs> <and then. laughs> yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. See you next week, everybody. See you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.